Okay, good. All right. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our first subspecialty grand rounds of the year. Uh, we're very pleased to have our neuro-ophthalmology department here presenting to us. Just as a reminder, um, for those who are relatively new to the department, we do subspecialty grand rounds. Um, each division is responsible for one day each year. And this is really an opportunity for your division to get in front of the faculty, update us on what's new, if there's new procedures, new staff, uh, new medications, new surgical procedures that we should be aware of as faculty. This is a great opportunity for you to update us all on those. And then really a great opportunity to showcase some of the interesting cases that are coming your way and utilize your fellows um, to help us learn. And so with that, I'll turn things over to our neuro-ophthalmology division. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. We're just going to go ahead and get started. Our first presentation is a clinical presentation from Riley Philbin, who is our pediatric neurology resident rotator. I'm sure that all of you, many of you have worked with her and she was awesome. I can just play the videos from the screen. Cool. Uh, I don't need them. Oh, it's okay, cool. <laughs> Hi, my name is Riley Philibin, and I'm a child neurology PGY3, and I'm going to talk to you guys today about an ocular movement disorder case that I admitted while on service uh, with PCH Neurology at Primary Children's, um, and then was able to see during follow-up in Dr. Vagunta's Pediatric neuro, neuro Ophthalmology Clinic. So this is a previously healthy six-year-old who presented with difficulty moving her eyes for the past two weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, the right eye began appearing esotropic, uh, followed by one week later, the left eye appearing esotropic. There had been recent suspicion for a GI illness with vomiting and sore throat prior to symptom onset uh, with no other major changes. The patient began bumping into objects frequently, having more difficulty navigating the stairs, and was growing hesitate to ambulate. There were no reported falls or concerns for head trauma during this time, um, but her mother also noted new slurring of her words and avoidance of eating. Social history was significant for a recent move from Hawaii. In the primary position, her eyes were notable for um, esotropia bilaterally left greater than right. After an examination revealed 2030 vision visual acuity in the right eye with 2025 in the left eye with normal color vision bilaterally and no RAPD present. Efferent examination revealed equal pupils with risk reactions, minus five abduction deficits bilaterally, minus two adduction deficits bilaterally, intermittent vertical nystagmus, full motility on up gaze and down gaze, intermittently able to briefly adduct each eye with significant effort and the ability to adduct on convergence with the oculocephalic reflex um, being absent. Neurologic exam was otherwise notable for um, possible dysarthria, but preserved deep tendon reflexes. Stereo acuity was zero for three on animals and zero three for circles. Now I'm gonna play some videos, and this was once the patient was admitted. So this wasn't her first presentation. Okay, one eye at a time, good, all the way up. Oh, and it has sound too. Um, so in the first video, you can see that the right eye has full superduction and infraduction with minus five abduction and minus three adduction. A little bit there, good job. Okay, switch eyes for me. And then on the left eye, you can see are also full with superduction and infraduction with a minus five abduction deficit and minus three okay. abduction deficit. And go down towards your toe, way down. Good job. Now we're going to do right and left. I know that's the hard one. Good. Good job, Cece. Okay. She's very cute. And now the last thing, uncover your both eyes. Look and then this up. next video. Good. Oops. Okay, one eye at a time. Good. All the way up. Good job. Down. We'll go a little slower. There we go. Uh, this next video just highlights a component of her vertical nystagmus and up gaze. Good. Go all the way up again for me. Good. Good, good. good job, Cece. Good job. Now look. And then this last video highlights um, her overcoming her adduction deficits with convergence with some significant effort towards the end here. Good. See how she overcomes that later. Perfect. Good, now go all the way. Okay. 
So initial exam was concerning for possible bilateral accommodative spasms, and she was discharged with very close outpatient follow-up. Um, exam three days later in clinic grew increasingly concerning for bilateral horizontal gaze palsies, and she was subsequently direct admitted to the PCH hospitalist service with neurology and ophthalmology consulting. At this point, her differential was most concerning for a demyelinating lesion, um, either something acute like a post-infectious syndrome or the initial presentation of a more chronic condition, um, a brain tumor, that particular localization most concerning for diffuse midline glioma or formerly known as the infamous DIPG, um, some sort of active ongoing CNS infection, um, as well as nutritional def deficiencies such as B12 or folate deficiency. On admission, MRIs of the neuroaxis were obtained with pertinent findings noted within the brainstem, um, as you can see in these pre and post contrast images. So this demonstrated confluent T2 flare hyperintensity and enhancement within the periaqueductal region, dorsal midbrain, dorsal pons, and dorsal medulla extending to the region of the obex with a geographically separate lesion highlighted by the arrow um, at the right a uh, ventral cervical medullary junction. This involved the facial colliculi and abducens nuclei bilaterally. And the presence of the geographically separate lesion suggested that this may be more representative of a post-infectious or inflammatory demyelinating process. Neoplasm at this point was considered less likely, but not entirely excluded. And then this is just the axial views of the same lesion. Right through here. And right through here, then on the other one, you can see with these arrows, this kind of more extensive lesion at this point, as well as this separate satellite lesion at the junction. Right there, and then right up there. Perfect. Thank you. I like that. Oh, there you go. There we go. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, and of course, now it's gone on the screen. There we go. Uh, so thorough autoimmune inflammatory and infectious workups were initiated following MRI uh, with pertinent findings outlined in red, including positive aquaporin-4 and glial fibrillary acidic protein antibodies, as well as a strongly positive ANA. The rest of her workup was overwhelmingly negative. With the workup results that were available at the time, neurology and ophthalmology both felt comfortable treating this as a post-infectious process uh, with a five-day course of high-dose methylprednisone. Unfortunately, there were minimal improvements in her speech and eye movements during this time. Uh, she then underwent a two-day course of IVIG with rapid return to baseline of speech and significant improvement in her eye movement abilities. She was discharged on 60 mg per keg or 60 mg per day of prednisone with a taper um, with further considerations for IVIG treatments if her progress plateaus. So final diagnosis, um, still to be determined or hopefully maybe probably not. Um, her aquaporin-4 and GFAP titers uh, were very low and likely represent false positives. Um, these same antibodies were also tested for separately on her ARUP demyelinating disease panel and were negative on that panel. PEDS autoimmune neurology was unable to send any repeat testing on her CSF studies as it was rejected by Mayo Clinic for add-on due to degradation of the sample in storage. Uh, this patient was last seen August 10th in Dr. Vagunta's PEDS neuroophthalmology clinic uh, with improvement in her bilateral horizontal gaze palsies, dysarthria, and esotropia, and is now wearing glasses full time and patching the right eye two hours a day. Unfortunately, the family had to cancel their first PEDS autoimmune uh, follow up appointment, um, but this has been rescheduled for today, September 20th, with Dr. Liu. So, hoping to be able to attend that this afternoon and see how she's doing. So this slide serves as a brief anatomy overview for anyone like me who doesn't have all of these memorized, um, but bilateral horizontal gaze palsy is a rare presentation caused by bilateral interruption of the medial, median longitudinal fasciculus, abducens nuclei, or parapontine, paramedian pontine reticular formation, or a combination of the three. Uh, this lesion, the lesion in this patient appears close in proximity to the abducens nuclei and to the PPRF um, containing the excitatory burst cells for horizontal gaze. Bilateral involvement of projections from the PPRF or the abducens nuclei would be able to explain her horizontal gaze palsy. The key difference kind of theoretically in differentiating between these lesions lies in assessment of the oculocephalic reflex. In the most simplified version of this arc, 
Angular rotation of the head causes endolymph in the horizontal semicircular canals to rotate opposite to the direction of the head, causing activation of the ipsilateral vestibular nucleus with inhibition of the contralateral vestibular nucleus, um, causing, causing the doll's eye reflex that we've come to know. Both vestibular nuclei then activate or inhibit both abducens nuclei, which send signals to the con corresponding ipsilateral lateral rectus and contralateral oculomotor, oculomotor nucleus through the MLF. Um, the abducens nuclei are imperative in this reflex arc. In the absence of the oculocephalic reflex in this patient would theor theoretically localize this lesion to the bilateral abducens nuclei. The oculocephalic reflex is often preserved in an isolated PPRF lesion due to a direct connection from the contralateral medial vestibular nucleus directly to the abducens nucleus, um, which can bypass the PPRF entirely. So while there's not a whole lot of um, literature of pediatric horizontal gaze palsies, I did want to briefly highlight this case of an 86-year-old male with left internal capsule stroke who could not initiate horizontal saccades to the right with preserved oculocephalic reflex uh, consistent with supranuclear right horizontal gaze palsy. Anatomically, the frontal eye fields are located between the premotor and prefrontal cortex and crucial for supranuclear control of horizontal conjugate gaze. Descending frontal eye field fibers project to the PPRF in the brainstem and lesions of this circuit at the PPRF abducens nucleus and or the MLF can produce various horizontal ocular deficits. The majority of stroke cases with conjugate gaze deviation are seen with cortical lesions affecting the frontal eye fields, as opposed to this case, which demonstrated disruption of frontal eye field fibers in the anterior limb of the internal capsule. The intact oculocephalic reflex and rapid resolution of this gaze palsy in this case is more consistent clinically with frontal eye field supranuclear lesion compared with a pontine lesion. And neuroimaging did not end up identifying any sort of pontine lesion in this patient that would otherwise have explained his deficits. This case just further highlights the anatomic localization of these various pathways as they exhibit control over components of horizontal gaze. So once horizon bilateral horizontal gaze palsies have been identified, there's a wide differential to consider. It is most important to note that um, the likely etiologies differ significantly depending on the age of the patient. <laughs> In adults, bilateral horizontal gaze palsies are highly concerning for multiple sclerosis, um, and cerebrovascular accidents represent the most common unilateral cause of horizontal gaze palsies, together with MS accounting for more than 50% of cases. In pediatric patients, post-infectious etiologies are thought to be the most common presentation of horizontal gaze palsies, followed by brain tumors. Other etiologies considered in pediatrics that would less commonly present in adults include Chiari malformations, nutritional deficiencies, and metabolic conditions. There's also concern um, that this may represent an initial presentation of a more chronic demyelinating lesion in this patient, um, particularly since repeat antibody testing could not be performed. So one last note I wanted to touch on is why did it look like this patient had accommodative spasm in her initial visit to the ED? So it turns out that this phenomenon has been reported during attempted abduction in patients with horizontal gaze palsies. These paradox paradoxical movements are theorized to be part of a near reflex substitution in which meiosis and myopic shift in refraction accompany the convergence movements. This has been well described in a pediatric patient with right-sided facial colliculus syndrome due to a pontine AV malformation. Uh, which manifested as near reflex substitution and convergent spasm on attempted rightward gaze. The authors proposed that the lesions of the virgin, virgin system, which are located in the pons, would result in overactivity of the virgin system located in the midbrain, and this clinically may present as accommodative spasm. The mechanism of this rare ocular movement disorder is still not clearly understood, um, and there's ongoing debate regarding whether this is secondary to a peripheral infranuclear mechanism or a central supranuclear mechanism. Uh, but regardless, this article was helpful in explaining why her depresentation very did closely resemble bilateral accommodative spasm. In conclusion, uh, bilateral horizontal gaze palsies in pediatric patients are rare, um, but the, the differential is broad, particularly within peds. Um, involvements of cranial nerves, other cranial nerves can help guide level of concern for the localized lesion versus a more systemic process. And like in our patient, we may not confidently identify the ultimate cause of onset. Um, while we hope this represents a one-time event most consistent with acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, she may end up having some sort of relapsing demyelinating condition that will need to be followed more closely over time. 
Uh, for now, follow-up will be most pertinent to monitor eye position and response to treatment, while in the long term, the patient will need to be followed to evaluate for any new neurologic symptoms. And that's the end. Those are some sources. Yep. Uh, they did the MRI the subsequent um, when she was direct admitted. So yes, she really did not get a scan of the first visit. So we were called um, initially at our easy ED visit, and her exam wasn't quite as profound as it was the next day. Um, her lethargy and her poor speech and all of that, but yeah, probably should have gotten that scan the first time around. I can also I can also comment on that because I was I actually was the one who saw her in the ED when she first presented. Um, it was a really tough exam. I see a lot of kids in um, in a lot of different stages of life in the ER. And when we first saw her, she was old enough. Um, she couldn't read the eye chart um, to do like the near chart to do numbers. So she didn't know numbers. We were doing visual acuity with the tumbling ease. Um, I tried even having her do the color plates to kind of boost her ability in the exam. And so I wasn't really sure if she was just like super shy. She was in the ER. She just had this huge move. Um, and it was really hard to get her to participate. Now, looking back, it's very obvious that those were symptoms of what was going on. Um, and so I reached out to the neuro-ophthalmology service and was like, I, I'm actually not sure. And we elected for prompt follow-up. So. Example, I just have to, I'm all good. And get it down with this. Sorry, what was the question? She was Dr. Long? Oh. You'll have to repeat it. Oh, sorry. Did did she have she have those abduction deficits when she was first seen? She did. Um, and and now, I mean, looking at those videos, right, it looks really obvious when she's in the ED, um, but she was almost so flat. I was like, is she just like not? And then given how she participated with like visual acuity exam, confrontation, visual field testing, um, I was just like, is this girl just like, is there actually something wrong or is she just like not participating in the exam? Um, and so I was I was really unsure what was going on. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a good learning there I, I, with the new abduction deficit. I mean, I, I I am baffled as to how she didn't get a scan in the ED. Um, even if you are convinced of accommodative spasm, I mean, we could have dilated her too and seen what that did with the with the um, with the accommodative spasm. But um, often, a lack of information from the patient too means that we need to dig a little deeper. Um, yeah. Uh, no, easier said than done, I know, but, um, yeah, interesting. Uh, how is she now? Is she still esotropic? Is she still? Over a month ago. How come we're patching? There, the answer was yes, she's still, e she was still esotropic, but that was a month ago. She was closing one eye a lot because she, because of her esotropia. Um, so we're patching the contralateral eye to yeah, encourage her to use it. Interesting. Okay. Do you have any thoughts? Do you have any thoughts, Bob? No. Bob just took a giant bite of food. So of course he got called on. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dr. Katz's uh, presentation is, is the main, the main show here. And so we're going to, I'm just going to breeze through this because his presentation is uh, downloading. Um, uh, I just wanted to briefly mention a an addition to our, our temporal arteritis protocol, um, which should shortly be on pulse. Um, a, as you know, we have a current temporal arteritis protocol. Uh, you can search under giant cell arteritis or temporal arteritis. As you know, uh, this is a condition of inflammation of the medium-sized blood vessels, which mostly affects the older population. And the constitutional symptoms are somewhat nonspecific, often associated with polymyalgia rheumatica. Uh, I wanted to mention a scenario in which a 65-year-old woman with a diagnosis of fibromyalgia 
presents with a new headache, but specifically not jaw claudication. She has no visual symptoms. Her sed rate is just a titch elevated. Her C-reactive protein is two platelets at 240, which is normal. Her primary care physician who just went to a CME program on temporal arteritis calls for an urgent temporal artery biopsy and started steroids immediately. Um, so one of the things that you can do is you can go to um, Dr. Ng's uh, really amazing normogram online where you can calculate that the risk of GCA in this scenario is about 8%. So not super high, but not zero. Um, Dr. Harry's out of town. And so what are you going to do? You're going to call the surgeon and get a stat temporal artery biopsy. Well, I want to uh, ask you to consider adding this to your regimen for this type of situation, especially uh, vessel wall imaging is a high resolution MRI technique where you use gadolinium to enhance uh, the wall of uh, large and medium sized uh, blood vessels. And uh, the, there's a protocol available through our radiology department and Scott McNally is the point person and can be phoned, paged, called at any moment, day or night. Um, uh, just mentioning the literature, there was a study in 2017, uh, prospectively of lots of patients, many of whom had biopsies, some of which were positive. That's actually a pretty high positive uh, rate on biopsies. But the MRI was abnormal in 60 patients. Um, and my favorite uh, statistical uh, useful thing is the positive and negative predictive value. The negative predictive value, so a normal MRI of the blood vessel wall, predicted normal temporal artery biopsy in 98% and a positive predictive value of 48%. So not super specific, but um, quite sensitive. And uh, there was a second study out of uh, Germany, which is extremely granular in comparing radiology and skip lesions and all that kind of stuff, but a similar type of results. And so... Um, both studies showed a loss of sensitivity after about five, five days of corticosteroid use. So you do have less than five days of steroids to get this done. Uh, temporal artery biopsy, you have several weeks probably. Temporal artery ultrasound, according to Dr. Harry, you can lose a positive in a day. So um, we ask you to add that to your regimen. It's um, not necessarily inexpensive. It's not necessarily easy to get, but it can save people a temporal artery biopsy. It can also um, make a diagnosis in a patient in whom a biopsy may be contraindicated because of medical issues or um, uh, gadolinium uh, sensitivity can sometimes be an issue. We had a really great patient for this, but she was truly allergic to gadolinium, so couldn't get this test. So she, I believe, ended up with a negative temporal artery biopsy. So um, I just wanted to put in a plug there, and the uh, updated uh, protocol should be on Pulse. Thank you. Um, Brad, I think, is next. Okay. Oh, Kathleen, I think, is next. I don't know how to do this, so. Um, what's you said press the right button. Kathleen's going to be updating on us. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I I want to uh, bring up three things uh, that you should know about idiopathic intracranial hypertension in 2023. Uh, our treatment goal to start with is really to prevent visual loss. And we have a great uh, protocol for fulminant progressive visual loss with papilledema, and you should all be aware of that. And we all know that we do medical therapy first uh, for patients with IIH, but if their vision progresses, we do a surgical procedure. And I'm going to talk about a, a new procedure that's gaining traction. The second thing is we want to reduce the headache because we've really found that headache is what drives the visual quality of life. So as your headache worsens, your visual quality of life also worsens. So we want to improve vision uh, and we want to re improve the quality of life. That means we have to take care of the headache. So the first new thing is that uh, IIH is now being considered probably a metabolic disease that uh, abdominal adiposity can affect vi 
venous pressure, and then venous pressure can increase the intracranial pressure. And we're finding out that there's an increase in insulin resistance in women who have IIH compared to BMI and age match controls, and they're also inflammatory markers. And this brings up a new treatment that is being proposed for IIH in addition to lowering the intracranial pressure. And that's a glucagon-like peptide or a GLP-1 agonist. This is in the news. I, I, I'm sure you've heard about it. But this is a gut neuropeptide secreted in the small intestines, and it's been used for uh, diabetes and weight loss. And um, it does a couple of things. One is that it inhibits glucagon release and lowers the blood glucose. And then it signals the hypothalamus to say, hey, I'm I'm, I'm full um, and I don't want to eat anymore. Plus it causes nausea. Um, and the other thing about this, is, these receptors is they are in the choroid plexus. And in uh, laboratory animals, it was found to reduce the intracranial pressure. And This drug is in the news. It's being touted to improve diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, every you name it. But for IIH, this is what we're looking at right now. Uh, And you're going to hear different names for this drug. Exenatide also goes by Beata. And then semaglutide is Wagovi, Wajovi, and Ozempic for diabetes. And it's the same drug, but it's got a different trade name depending on what it's treating. And it does lower the weight by 15%. It has been studied in IIH. Um, In Birmingham, England, they uh, inserted little uh, sensors uh, to follow the intracranial pressure uh, in 16 patients who were enrolled. It was a prospective trial. They all had this uh, pressure are reading at two and a half hours, 24 hours, and 12 weeks. And uh, this drug did lower the pressure at all of those time points. Um, And then there was an open label trial of 39 patients. Uh, 13 had received the GLP-1 receptor agonist, and 26 had usual care. Uh, Weight loss was definitely increased with the GLP-1 group. There was no difference in the visual outcome at six months. The headache, it did improve a little bit more with the GLP-1, and the big uh, side effect was nausea. The second uh, study for weight loss is the bariatric surgery trial that just came out. This was a trial that randomized 66 women with BMIs over 35 uh, to a Weight Watchers program or a bariatric surgery program. Uh, And it did lower the intracranial pressure. And the RUIN-Y procedure was the best procedure for weight loss. Uh, And they they lost a lot of weight. Their quality of life did improve. Their headaches did not improve. And and remember that weight loss surgery and weight loss alone is not going to fix the vision uh, right away. So we still have to follow the vision very carefully. Um, So there were no deaths, but there was one bariatric surgery complication of obstruction. Okay, the other new thing that I want to uh, touch about is venous sinus stenting. Uh, We have known for many, many years that as the venous pressure goes up, the intracranial pressure goes up as well. And you can see this graph from 1934, where the, the CSF pressure rises as the venous pressure rises. And this brings up the fact that as as our venous pressure rises, you can get venous outflow obstruction because the vein will reduce itself, and then you get venous hypertension, you get a decrease in CSF absorption, then you get increased intracranial pressure, and then you get more stenosis. And many times in our patients with IIH, we see this venous sinus uh, stenosis, uh, either unilateral or bilateral. So the new kid on the block for treatment of IIH is uh, venous sinus stenting. And the, the, the indications are usually when you have a big, large arachnoid granulation, as you can see, I think my arrow is working or maybe not. But anyway, you see the big arrow there uh, at the arachnoid granulation. And also these septi um, are also present. And you can stent across these. Here's a stent going through the septum. Uh, The indications are it has to have greater than eight millimeters of mercury pressure gradient across the stenosis, and the pressure really has to be elevated at uh, 220 or 2020 millimeters of mercury. 
Uh, and you have to, these people have to be on clopidogrel and aspirin. So there can't be any contraindication to that. And uh, it has been used for severe disabling headaches associated with intracranial hypertension, focal neurologic deficits, rampant papilledema, and visual changes. There was this large metadata meta-analysis that came out on 49 studies, 250 patients, and you can see that the pressure improved in almost all of them. The transient visual obscurations also improved, pulsatile tinnitus improved, headache resolved in 37%, improved in 41%, but of all the parameters, that again was the least likely to resolve. Papilledema did resolve in 41% and improve in 38%, but there are complications. And the main one is uh, thrombosis. There's been subdural hematomas, intracerebral hem hematomas, cerebral edema, stent migration, and even death. Uh, so if you're going to look at all of our procedures, you can see that uh, in this review, it was a wonderful review that looked at all of them. You know, nurse Fenestration really is very helpful for papilledema, but it but the other procedures do treat it. The stents, the shunts, uh, visual fields improve in all. Most of them have some headache improvement. Maybe the optic nerve sheath fenestration is the least. Um, and then you can see that all procedures have complications and shunts. The problem is about half of these can fail. Um, and so we, we kind of shy, shy away from shunting. So, uh, in conclusion, IIH is most likely a metabolic disorder. Definitely more work needs to be done. I think it behooves all of us to know about the GLP-1 agonists, about weight loss. We don't really know what the effect is going to be for headache or visual loss. Weight loss surgery is a treatment for weight loss, but not for visual loss. And stenting may play a role in treatment of some patients that don't respond to medic medical therapy or some of our other uh even surgical therapies. That is all. Do you have any questions? Yes. How long does it take to see the results of the stenting? Uh, so from the papilledema to go away? Yeah. Well, the pressure will go back to normal almost immediately after the stent. And so, and, and as you know, papilledema is very variable from person to person, what actually happens, but the pressure will lower almost immediately after the stent. And then the papilledema usually gets better within a few weeks. Uh, so the question is about women and metabolic disorder and the free mal preponderance. Well, we do know that, that um, uh, obesity, um, diabetes, and this metabolic syndrome is more frequent in women all by itself. Uh, uh, people with IIH are more prone to, let's say, polycystic ovarian disease. And so there are these metabolic and endocrine abnormalities that are being thought to be more prevalent in women than in men. Uh, you know, the, the answer is definitely not out there, but, you know, we have a lot of obese men and we don't see that much IIH. It's got to be the hormones. Of course. Um, so apparently there's going to be a fire drill at any minute. So it is a, it is a drill and we're not supposed to evacuate. Um, so I do, um, some medical legal consulting as a side hustle and, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's actually very interesting. I learn a lot about how doctors think, how lawyers think, and, um, uh, and also really see some interesting medical things go wrong, uh, from which one can learn. And so I got permission from, a plaintiff uh, who had sued her ophthalmologist because they missed the diagnosis of pituitary tumor. I got her permission to present her case here just for uh, an example of like what not to do as an eye doctor and also kind of to get a little insight into how the medical legal system works. Um, these are my financial disclosures. They're not relevant to today's presentation. Um, I was inspired by this article by Noble David in 2006 where he he also did some legal consulting and he presented six cases in the Journal of Neuroophthalmology where ophthalmologists had been successfully sued for missing the diagnosis of pituitary apoplexy. 
Um, for those of you that didn't read the presentation that I sent by uh, email, this is a 55 year old uh, patient with two weeks of decreased vision uh, and one day of headaches. On examination, she's got hand motions, vision, and afferent pupillary defect in a pale nerve in one eye. Uh, she's told uh, she's diagnosed with ischemic optic neuropathy, told to come back in six weeks. At six weeks, her exam was unchanged. The eye doctor told her to get evaluated for sleep apnea because she didn't have high blood pressure, diabetes, or high cholesterol. Uh, at 12 weeks, um, she went in, she was supposed to come back in three months, but instead she came back in 12 weeks. No. Anyway, she came back early. I think she was, uh, and, and uh, now she's got 2200 vision in her previously unaffected eye. Um, and uh, to make a long story short, uh, she, went to the emergency room, had an MRI scan, which showed a pituitary tumor uh, that was uh, resected. And then uh, she ended up being no light uh, perception in, in the one eye and 2030 in her previously unaffected eye with a dense temporal defect. So she was left with just a nasal crescent of vision in one eye. And she ended up suing her, the vitreoretinal surgeon uh, who misdiagnosed her with ischemic optic neuropathy. So um, I was going to ask uh, Dr. Kennedy if the retina doctor deviated from the standard of care, but he's in the OR at the VA. And uh, so, oh, brilliant. Do you have a microphone? Yeah, I do. So I, I can answer for Brandon. Okay. Um, I was thinking about this question earlier this morning, and I found it a little difficult because we get such good neuro ophthalmology training here at the program. And so I'm not sure if that skews how I see this, but, um, I, I personally feel like he might have deviated from the standard of care. There were two big points that stood out to me. Um, and this actually goes to my own question. I think number three yeah. is that when we all learn in general medicine, even through neurology, that if you have a headache with any of these red flag other things like this patient was over 50. I don't know if it's her first one, but then it was also, it could have been a new headache, but really it had visual symptoms and exam findings along with it. Um, usually when that happens, it's like a straight way to get imaging right away. And so I think that's a first point. But the other thing that struck me too, was that he sent the patient back to the optometrist when there was more vision loss. And that was also another huge red flag that we should be investigating more instead of just chalking this up to a new or like a refractive error. And so for me, yes, I think he did deviate from standard of care. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And, and I think the, um, uh, this, this case was settled. It didn't actually go to trial. And, um, but I think the, uh, the defense attorneys were also convinced that maybe their client had deviated from the standard of care. Um, so, uh, um, uh, uh, the question is, did, did the, did the, um, did the retina specialist order a said rate in a CRP? He did not. Um, I, and you know, I, I don't know, the patient's 55 years old, her risk of giant cell arteritis is pretty low. That wouldn't be the first thing on my mind, but he didn't order any tests actually that I know of. Um, Dr. Sauer is going to tell us if the optometrist who originally saw the patient deviated from the standard of care. Maybe. Yeah. No. Um, so I think one thing that the optometrist realized is that he didn't know what was going on and that he needed to refer the patient uh, to somebody else who might be able to figure it out. But in terms of did he deviate from the standard of care, I think yes as well, because we all know that to get into a retinal specialist, it takes some time. And this patient, as Tony mentioned, obviously had some red flags and needed to be examined and seen uh, a lot sooner. And I think the correct uh, way for the optometrist to refer this patient would have been to the emergency room right away um, because there was uh, an optic nerve, a pale optic nerve without edema, and that warrants imaging, um, especially in the setting of vision loss and the new headache. Um, he should have send the patient not to a retinal specialist that can't see them for six weeks, but to the emergency room to get imaging and be seen the same day. Yeah, so I think Dr. Sauer brings up a good point, and that is that um, everything in medicine is kind of black and white. You're pregnant, you're not pregnant. You're alive, you're dead. You're sick, you're well. But everything in the legal system is gray. 
nothing is black and white in the legal system. And so this is a gray area because the standard of care for an optometrist is different from the standard of care for an ophthalmologist. And so as an ophthalmologist, I actually can't testify to the standard of care for an optometrist. You actually have to get a, an expert witness who's an optometrist to um, to express that opinion. But I actually think the optometrist did the right thing. They knew that they didn't know what was wrong with the patient, and so they referred them on. I mean, they should have referred them to a neuro-ophthalmologist, but at least they knew that they um, didn't know what the diagnosis was and needed some help, whereas I think the retina specialist also didn't recognize that they didn't know what was wrong and didn't recognize that they needed to ask for help. Um, Dr. Etheridge, was the ischemic optic neuropathy diagnosis reasonable under the circumstances? Is Tyler here? Um, okay, so I will answer for him. So uh, I'd say the sine qua none, that, that means like that with which out one, it doesn't exist. For ischemic optic neuropathy is a swollen nerve. So if you see a pale optic nerve, you cannot make the diagnosis of ischemic optic neuropathy. Now you could be right that that was what actually happened, but you actually have to have seen a swollen optic nerve in order to make this diagnosis. And the swelling should resolve within about six weeks or so. So I think that the, uh, the uh, retina, I really fault the retina specialist again, you can't assume that just because ischemic optic neuropathy seems like the most likely thing in a 55 year old with no risk factors, then um, you can't make that diagnosis. Okay, so uh, Dr. DeSatels was going to talk about posterior ischemic optic neuropathy and its uh, prevalence compared to a compressive optic neuropathy. Yeah, so the short answer to this is no. Posterior ischemic optic neuropathy is not more common than a compressive optic neuropathy. It There's not, not a lot of incidence data out there about this. For ischemic optic neuropathy on the aggregate and you know, comprising both anterior and posterior ischemic optic neuropathies, the overall rate, you know, you're looking at something on the order of like two to ten per hundred thousand in the US population. Um, but series that have looked at posterior versus anterior ischemic optic neuropathy within ION as a bin see that about only four percent of ION cases are actually PION. Um, so the incidence is probably somewhere closer to 0.08 to um, 0.4 per 100,000. Um, so it's certainly much, much less common. And compressive optic neuropathy has a rate of about one to um, two per 100,000. Thanks for uh, looking up the uh, epidemiology. Um, but yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, posterior ischemic optic neuropathy is extremely rare and it's actually a diagnosis of exclusion. And um, uh, so one would never want to make that diagnosis without first chasing down the other more common etiologies like a, a compressive optic neuropathy. Um, thanks. Um, we do have a chat question. If the patient is seen in a delayed time frame after the referral and the optometrist didn't specify the time frame, is the liability of both parties? I'd say... Um, that's that's another gray area. You know, I'd say again, as an optometrist, they might not have realized that this is an urgent situation. If the patient then comes to you, and there's been a big delay between the time that um, uh, that you see the patient and the time that the optometrist specified, you know, as long as you do the right thing, you're not going to be liable um, because as soon as you because this is not actually your patient until they appear in your clinic, and so. I would say that you're that the um, that in that case the ophthalmologist is probably not liable if you know if they if they do the right thing after the first visit, not after the third visit. Um, but and the optometrist may or may not be liable. Again, that's going to be a gray area. Um, Doctor um, Akiri was going to talk about whether or not the vitreo retinal specialist. Um, should have been expected to diagnose a compressive optic neuropathy because, I mean, like a pituitary tumor, that's not that's not part of being a vitreo retinal specialist. That's diagnosed by other specialties, and I just couldn't like I actually read that, and this was an actual thing that was written by another ophthalmologist, 
in a report that they filed for the defense. And I was just, that really got my blood boiling because, you know, I think that we're uh, doctors first, ophthalmologists second, and specialists third. And um, as an ophthalmologist, you you should, even if you're specialized in vitreo retinal surgery or cornea or glaucoma or pediatrics, you, you should be able to, to hear this story, see this patient and know that they uh, either need to be referred to another specialist, which is fine. You don't have to make the diagnosis yourself or you need to work the patient up. You can't just uh, assign them a diagnosis and uh, let it go. Okay, uh, Dr. Mohammed was gonna talk about um, what missing piece of information caused the defendant to miss the correct diagnosis. So oh, wait yeah, a little yeah. bit. <laughs> but uh, in terms of uh, missing, missing piece of information, I feel like, you know, in this case, uh, an optic neuropathy, neuropathy of uncertain ideology in addition to neurological symptoms, including headache, right. uh, you know, pretends uh, additional workup, uh, particularly uh, brain imaging. So just with those two um, kind of exam findings and in history, um, I think it's pretty obvious in our case that you know, that patient should have received a scan or at the very least uh, subspecialty referral to neuro-ophthalmology. Yeah, so uh, this again was an, a sentence that I read in a letter filed by an ophthalmologist in defense of the um, uh, vitreo retinal specialist that said that uh, because the patient did not report vision loss in her left eye at the initial presentation, that that was their fault. And because she was a poor historian, that that's what caused the, the retina specialist to miss the diagnosis. And to me, that's victim blaming, you know, like, uh, I'm not even sure that the patient, I mean, the patient probably did have some vision loss in her left eye at the initial appointment, but I don't think she was aware of it. Her visual acuity was normal. Um, so to say that the patient is a poor historian and make that as an excuse for somebody missing the diagnosis is inexcusable. No, that's a question for one of, that's a question for one of the residents. Um, Dr. Polsky was going to opine on whether or not pituitary tumors are slow growing. And if the patient had had uh, surgery after the initial presentation, the visual outcome would have been the same. This is another argument made by the defense. Yeah. Um, I guess a couple things. So it's true that generally most pituitary adenomas are slow growing. Some of the things I read were around like one to three millimeters per year. Um, which first of all, I mean, if someone has a large pituitary tumor that's abutting the optic chiasm, even very minor changes can can potentially cause devastating visual um, changes. The other thing is to um, not to bring up visual fields again, but but yeah, yeah, if sure. I mean if if a baseline visual field had been obtained, then they could have objectively potentially objectively shown if there was any change over time, but they didn't do that. And so they, there's no way for them to show that, um, you know, that there was no progression. The other thing is that's kind of crazy to me about this argument is that they went from hand motion vision to no light perception in the right eye. And they went from, I think it was like 2030 in the left eye to 2200. And so there was objective changes in the visual acuity, which can be explained by what was ultimately found, the, the pituitary tumor. So I, I think this argument is not, not great. Yeah, no, I, no, I agree with you. And um, uh, this is a little bit a more, a more gray area, you know, because Dr. Polsky is absolutely right. These tumors are very slow growing. But the fact that the patient had vision at her initial presentation had vision loss of only two weeks and had this new headache tells me that she probably bled into the tumor. And when you bleed into a pituitary tumor, that's pituitary apoplexy, you have rapid expansion of the tumor. And, um, uh, and if you deal with it right away, if you decompress it right away, you can save the vision. And if you don't decompress it, then as Dr. Polsky said, even that little additional compression of the chiasm and the optic nerves can lead to irreversible vision loss.
Um, that's hard to say. Like, actually, that's that's that's. I'm going to actually push that question off. Uh, Dr. Kirsten was asking uh, because the nerve was pale at the initial presentation. Isn't that proof that her uh, prognosis was poor? I'm going to push that off to one of the residents because that's another question we've got coming up in the time we have left. Uh, Dr. Wilkinson currently rotating on neuroophthalmology. What ophthalmic testing at the initial visit would have best predicted the potential for visual recovery, which it directly addresses Dr. Kirsten's question. So in OC, well, yeah. sorry, saved by the bell. Um, right on. So an OCT RNFL would have been really helpful yes. in this situation. Excellent. Because uh, thinning of the optic nerve head would have been uh, predictive of worse visual outcomes. Yeah, so uh, that's that's actually a real uh, that there's some literature on this. A retinal nerve fiber layer scan at the initial visit would have predicted her um, visual um, best predicted her visual recovery. And I think Dr. Kirsten's right. With a pale nerve, your prognosis for recovery in that eyes it might be guarded. It's another gray area because none of these tests were done. Um, but um, I think the prognosis for the other eye, which was un which as far as we know was uninvolved at the initial presentation, was much much better. And so I think we could have preserved vision in her in her uh, left eye if if action had been taken at the initial visit and not delayed by eighteen weeks. Uh, and then Doctor Wirtz was going to address my question: What do we do when we encounter patients who are poor historians? I'm over here on the side, um, but I think there are kind of two things that come to mind. And one is that you, if you have reason to believe that this patient might be a poor historian, you have to expand your differential and you have to um, uh, rely more heavily on your exam. And um, so I think like in terms of, you know, there, there are a lot of things you can do in terms of doing more extensive chart review, you know, get more of a sense of what's this patient history, what risk factors do they have? Um, and you, you know, even just expanding your differential can make you think of about things that maybe their history might not tell you. But again, if you're relying on your exam, if you're saying, okay, I'm going to take the objective data that I'm getting from my exam, then, and using that to drive your differential and any potential testing or workup that you might get. And that means that you might do a more extensive workup than you would do for another patient, but right. that's kind of your job as the physician is to figure out what workup do I need to be not just anchor on one diagnosis, but to convince myself that I'm not missing something else. What are the, the can't miss things that I need to be ruling out? What are the uh, more serious things? And then kind of as a side note, you know, it's impossible to say whether this was truly part of this particular encounter, but I think anytime you start to think to yourself, or consider the possibility that the patient in front of you is a poor historian, you also kind of have to think to yourself, why do I think they're a poor historian? Just because I think sometimes it's easy, you know, if, if we as physicians often have some unconscious biases as well that might cause us to um, not take patients seriously or not believe them or um, to maybe not consider the the things that they're telling us as seriously, maybe as we should, because of something else that we're thinking about, either we're anchoring on a diagnosis or there's some other factor. And so I think that, you know, before you assume that somebody's a poor historian, you have to be considering that as well. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think uh, your point, uh, the, the, the thing that I would take away from what you just said, uh, Dr. Wirtz, is when we all encounter patients who are poor historians, and in that case, we can't rely on the history we have to go the extra mile with our exam and testing. And so if you want to go down the road of saying that this patient was a poor historian, then you need to go the extra mile as the examining physician and do additional testing, go the extra mile to really figure out what's wrong with the patient because you can't rely on the history. It's not an excuse for not getting the right diagnosis. Um, and in this case, a visual field, absolutely. I'm sure that if the vitreo retinal specialist had done a visual field at the first visit, there would have been a small temporal defect in the left eye and they probably would have tumbled to the right diagnosis and gotten an MRI scan. Uh, one neuro-ophthalmologist has commented to me that visual fields are the most underutilized test in ophthalmology, and I think I agree. That was certainly the case in, uh, in uh, here. Okay, uh, we have one other chat question. I'd make a case for a visual field whenever there is something funny about the history or exam. Uh, that's absolutely true. I agree with that 
Um, visual field tests should always be your go-to when there's unexplained vision loss. That should be your knee-jerk reaction. Um, Dr. Warner has a comment. I just want to add that sometimes the reason why a patient is a poor historian is because they could be afraid of what the diagnosis might be, and they want to minimize things and brush things off, uh, perhaps even more than the clinician. And because they're afraid that they've got a brain tumor, they don't want to mention that word. If they do, they need a scan. Yes. It's hard. You know, it's so ordering scans, but before the field, there's a so how would something like this have presented, been worked up and figured out? Uh, Dr. Curzon's question is how would you, I mean, how would you work this up if you couldn't get a CT scan or an MRI? Like let's say you were working in a uh, uh, under-resourced country where, you know, that wasn't, you know, readily available in the next building over like it is here. Um, I think you could, I think you can still do um, skull x-rays just about anywhere. Um, sure. I'm, yeah, you might see an enlarged cella turcica on a skull, a, a skull X-ray. Um, you could do endocrine testing. Like if you were suspicious of a pituitary tumor, you could do um, endocrine testing. You could certainly do a visual field. I mean, I think visual fields were around before the Beatles. Even confrontation fields. I'm sorry, a red ball or doing fields with a red ball. Yeah, I, yeah, you definitely have to be a little bit more resourceful and. Um, uh, uh, when you, when, when you don't have an MRI scanner in the next building. So I'm, I'm sorry, we're out of time. Uh, Dr. Patil and Dr. Sanchez won't be able to get to your, uh, the questions that I had sent to you. I apologize because it's uh, nine o'clock. Um, hey, I am Brad. One circling back to your comments yes. before you end on the timing of the consultation, the highest dollar amount suits in ophthalmology now relate to retinopathy prematurity and ophthalmologists have been held accountable both for failing to get the patient in in a timely manner so the time they've looked at it from the time that was it was scheduled not when you met the patient and so that you are responsible for that and and the other issue is that ophthalmologists have been found accountable for failing to recognize that the patient didn't show failing to track the patient down and successfully get them in when they, in, in all these circumstances involving bad outcomes with everlasting lifelong visual impairment. So be careful with that and make sure your staff's aware of what they're doing because some of these are a bit gray areas. And uh, uh, um, unfortunately the courts have come down uh, 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 leaning on the ophthalmologist in that circumstance it's a dangerous world out there. Darn right. Okay. And with that thought, have a great oh, Wednesday. Cheery day, right? <laughs> yeah, have a delightful day and career. Yeah.